Good morning. This is Al Otero. Once again with you, bringing you incredible people, telling you amazing information to help you succeed in local and global markets. This segment, as always, is sponsored and presented by University Ana Mendes, which is one of our trustee members of the Global Trade Chamber and a sponsor of the, this very special webinar today. Uh, it's an international university, and uh, we're very honored to have them be part of the chamber. Uh, today, we have a very special guest uh, that is a faculty member for Ana Mendes University, and he is going to touch on a very important topic today, which is import-export. Uh, they tell us that about 90% of the world's consumers are outside of the United States. So if you're not exploring international markets, you're missing out on a huge opportunity to sell your product or service. And as you know, almost everything can be exported now from accounting, legal, construction, counseling, and every product you can imagine, it can be exported. So let me bring up uh, to the stage our guest presenter today. Uh, Mr. Michael McCarthy. He is an international businessman. Hi, Michael. Hi, Al. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Thanks it's for the opportunity. Have you. Uh, we've known Michael for many years. Michael is an international entrepreneur, has lived in other countries. He has worked in logistics for a long time, and he is uniquely qualified to give us some tips and information on succeeding in local international markets, import, export, everything you wanted to know, but you were afraid to ask. And here's <laughs> Mr. Michael McCarthy. Professor McCarthy, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I have um, the presentation today, we'll go through a lot of generalities, and then I've got towards the end, we have some, some key uh, and very important uh, issues that people should be aware of. Okay, so uh, nothing else, so we'll get started. Okay. Great, welcome. Welcome. So what I've got here is I'm going to give you an overview, some history, some milestones that uh, how kind of like where we got where we are. We'll look at some the current world air and marine. Let's see what's out there. It's amazing. I'll show you what's that. And then we'll talk about inter international trade drivers, what drives people either to import or export. And, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let's look at some uh, how we cho we'll choose a product or how to choose products and selecting markets, etc. All right. So. On we go. This is something that we're all suffering from doing these um, remote communications. And this is uh, Dilbert, if you don't recognize him, uh, engineer working in a international trade. Uh, and he's doing a garbled uh, conference, which we all have these things where we have poor communication. So he doesn't understand what's saying. Uh, uh, I don't know what you're saying. He's saying, you know, your accent's too thick. I can't understand. And they're murmuring. And he says, I don't understand what what you said, uh, I can't tell which who's talking, and then they keep going back and forth, and you're acting as if I, if I, something, but I don't know what the topic is. Then you're saying goodbye. You're shaking your head as if I agreed on something. And his boss, this is his boss, comes and asks him, "Was successful? It was the best call I had all week, right?" These these sometimes these communications are very difficult, and there's issues on language and in, uh, in culture, but. Let me look at some international uh, milestones, and I'm going to. Uh, Al will ring the bell when I, we get to the, the time and get everything done in in, uh, in about 50 minutes here. There was a uh, conference. World War II was major in international trade, at least in our lifetimes, uh, in creation of international monetary fund. We've all heard of the IMF. So this was necessary after World War II to kind of stabilize and establish how do you do trade? How are you moving your money back and forth? And this is key when we're dealing with international banking and letters of credit, this kind of thing. Right? And uh, <clears throat> there's this general tariff agreement in 48. So these things are kind of evolving. And uh, as we've gone towards uh, international um, standardized customs, uh, you'll, you'll probably find these general uh, classifications for product. If you have a ballpoint pen, it has a classification number. And that number is going to be the same whether it's uh, going to the Sudan or whether it's going to France or whether it's going to Jamaica right, or coming from there. And then we have these general tariff agreements. Okay, so this is the reduction of tariffs, the GATT, 
as the, the Kennedy rounds. Now we're back a gap of about 20 years before things started to pick up um, the Tokyo round. Okay? And we start getting Uruguay, you start seeing it's the, the frequency of things start to pick up. Uh, the Treaty of Rome, general overall, then we had the World Trade Agreements and, and the WTO sounds familiar. Uh, very important to be part of the WTO because we're inter the agreements, the sharing and protecting uh, intellectual property. So um, your patents, these kind of things are all kind of embedded in this uh, trade, World Trade Organization. And the Euro's creation obviously <clears throat> created a giant trading group uh, in, in, in Europe, which continues to grow. Um, and they actually, the Euro circulated officially as a currency, as an actual piece of, of money uh, in 2020. Uh, all right, so this is just kind of, if you like things graphic, when we're talking about the um, Bretton Wood Conference at 44, and I said the frequency started to pick up until we get all the way over here. Uh, the creation of the euro in 2002. Now I want you to think of this is probably in in again in our lifetimes these little boxes these container boxes and that was in the 1950s uh, and, and I want you to we'll look at a little video here so in the 1970s new companies like FedEx DHL introduced these 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 shipping uh, documents and 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 uh, taking over DHL actually takes over cargo. You can ship your pallets this way, import, export, even household goods start moving back and forth through people like DHL and FedEx. Um, air shipments as uh, these planes became larger and began to move uh, air shipments. And we'll look at the airplanes that are in the, in, in the air right now uh, in a few minutes. Uh, fuel obviously is the most important part of that the important cost component in, in air and in the uh, 70s actually it became when we had the oil uh, OPEB it began to become a very important component of sea traffic uh, this little steel boxes and the first containers were just that steel boxes you will get international uh, container trade right now Container shipping moves 95% of all manufactured goods around the world. In 2017, more than $4 trillion worth of products were sent over the oceans. It's an industry that underpins the global economy. But it wasn't always as big or as efficient as it is today. The idea of shipping started in 3rd century BC, when merchants realized that sending products over sea was cheaper and faster than by land. Early on, goods were loaded onto ships in sacks, barrels, and wooden crates with scores of dock workers, squeezing them on decks or in tight spaces below. Ships often spent more time at ports than sailing, and not much changed until 1956. That's when American truck driver Malcolm McLean stacked 58 metal boxes on a ship going from New Jersey to Houston. This idea completely revolutionized the industry. The containers not only protected the products, but when the ships docked at ports, truck beds and freight trains could take them away without repackaging. A flurry of innovation followed, and container sizes were standardized. In 1966, more McCormick Lines started the first transatlantic container service. And then in 1968, one of the first modern container ships hit the water. The Japanese Hakone Maru carried 752 20-foot containers using a standard still used today. Cargo could now be moved from purpose-built vessels to rail and roads in massive volumes, cutting transport costs by at least 75%. This led to the emergence of global shipping behemoths, like Denmark's Maersk Line, France's CMA CGM, and China's Costco. By the 1980s, around 90% of manufactured goods were containerized. From designer dresses and food to home goods, electronics, and heavy machinery. Globalization exploded as ships moved Asian goods to the West and vice versa, making stops at dozens of ports along the way. Recently, the Panama and Suez canals were expanded, allowing for bigger ships to cross and in greater numbers. But it's not all been smooth sailing. 
the industry has been plagued by too many ships in the water, sparking a series of price wars that plunged many operators deep into the red and completely sank others. This caused a wave of consolidation, seeing the top 20 ocean carriers shrink to 11, a number that's expected to get even smaller. Shipping has also seen criticism from governments and environmentalists, who say that it's responsible for around a quarter of the world's nitrogen oxide pollution. In response, operators are adopting cleaner fuels like natural gas. Today, the industry continues to boom. Container ships are as high as the Empire State Building if turned upright and can move more than 20,000 boxes each. A single container can hold 10,000 iPads at a cost of five cents each from Shanghai to Hamburg. The average TV coming to the U.S. from China costs less than $2 to ship. The most recent growth has been in refrigerated shipping. Fresh produce, food, and flowers that once only moved by plane are now shipped on satellite-tracked reefer boxes that keep them fresh. Bananas can last in these for up to 50 days. So what does the future hold? Likely crewless behemoths running on batteries that can move 50,000 containers, and global cargo distributed through blockchain technology that will eliminate paperwork and further cut costs. Later this year, the first so-called Tesla of the Seas will hit the water in a Norwegian fjord, moving fertilizer from a production site to an export port. The ship will replace thousands of truck routes through populated areas. Amazing. Hmm? So we can get by this. <coughs> Hopefully we can close this. Watch later, okay. No, sorry. I'm trying to get by this. So in the in the meantime, think of uh, <clears throat> in the um, 70s, late 70s, the European Union signed agreements with most uh, countries that everything would become, um, you know, would become, uh, I'm trying to get by this, okay, I'm going down, would um, become containerized into, into Europe. And that meant by uh, people had to, around the world, countries had to ad adapt and put in container ports, uh, container operations uh, to move. Coffee used to be a bulk cargo, uh, sugars, all of these had to become bagged cargoes or box cargoes and go into containers. It was a major, major shift. Now, in between Europe and the United States, at one time, there were 500 uh, cargo vessels. When containerization finally uh, took root, there was only 50 vessels. Uh, it's amazing how that has changed because they're much larger. I just wanted to, when we're looking at the world uh, economies and world trade, uh, I want you to bear with me for a few minutes. And this is where China was in 1880. You can see that was the prime economy in the world in 1880. And uh, where's our U.S.? Uh, where? Oh, yeah. Okay, we were here as a second uh, economy in the world in 1880. And we'll go through to um, more current day. You see on your right the GDP per capita, or gross national gross domestic product per person. So as we go through here, I think there's major um, milestones historically for us.
think as we move towards the civil war in the United States, things will, will change. You can see the comparative size of uh, Russia. For a second here, looking at how how the U.S. has moved forward at this in this point in 1900, that you've got uh, or we had at that point uh, rail communication uh, between one coast and another, uh, tremendous production in the Midwest. Then we had now had communication, uh, not only uh, wire we had we been in wireless communication in those periods, in which it was a real a real boom for the U.S. To see how large a Brazilian economy is and how it's been growing and growing and growing. Okay, 2010, here it goes. Running neck and neck, whoop, 2014. Okay, now these are estimates, okay. United Nations estimates of uh, growth.
almost done. We're almost done. So I want <clears throat> my students usually see this and ask, uh, what should we do? And a uh, comment a couple of weeks ago was one of the students is actually is in Beijing online, and he said, um, learn Mandarin. Uh, so I think I have to remove that, go down one. Uh, what, let's not do that one. I just want you to look at, um, if I can, I think you're, we're sharing the screens here, but let me do this. Um, let's do, this is, we talked about international air traffic. This is what's out there right now. These are, this is a live, uh, everybody has trans, transponders. So we know this is a, these are cargo in, in um, personal planes. So if I look at, let's see, pick a plane. You can um, do this. So this is this is the airline, this is the company. Uh, we know where it's going. It's going to Vancouver, Canada, uh, and time arrival. Uh, this is of course free. If you were to pay for it, you could get more information about the what they might be. Now, <clears throat> in the pandemic, one of the things that was tremendous effect on this, if you went back and looked at and time wise looked at the pandemic. Uh, the underbellies of all of these planes, like this particular passenger plane, under the underbelly, underneath this is cargo. So besides your baggage, they're carrying uh, cargo, uh, generalized uh, small pieces of cargo. They may be in, in containerized, but it's still uh, a, a large portion of this. It's, it's adjusting every, every few seconds. Uh, a large portion of, of uh, cargo traffic is uh, air traffic is un in the underbellies of planes, of passenger planes. So when that uh, friend, good friend of mine, he's a vice president of uh, DHL and works on, uh, on air cargo. And he said they, when the pandemic gave them a backup of, or resulted in a backup of probably, uh, depending on the type of cargo between you know, two, three weeks to a month and a half. Because they just didn't have the capacity to, pick up the slack of what was moving in uh, in passenger planes. So this is like tremendous, tremendous traffic. And you can, if you go into this website, um, I make these available uh, to you, the, the, the links, and you can actually dis decipher pl uh, planes on the ground or planes in the air. You can uh, change the size of the planes and just look at a few, but anyways, I thought this is, I always find this extremely interesting to see the major air traffic is always gets concentrated in this band up here. And, um, well, hopefully, let me just close that. And then I drop off YouTube. No, oh, here I'm back again. All right, this this particular one, uh, <clears throat> after 9-11, the a lot of additional controls came on. And one of the ones with the International Maritime Association, the IMOs <clears throat> around the world, all the cargo vessels and passenger vessels and even pleasure vessels have IDs, transponders on them. Unless you're out there in a canoe, most of what you're going to be going around with have this. So what we're looking at here is obviously the world. And the red ones are um, tankers and the green ones our cargo vessels. So I would just want to take you over here and show you. Recently, we had an issue with the Suez Canal, right? and people woke up to major public woke up to the fact that uh, between eight and twelve percent of cargo goes through here, and there's the canal over here, and it comes down to the the um, w worldwide. You're in a precarious situation. Not only do you have the Thing, if something happens to the canal, all this traffic is stopped. But this particular strait is only eight miles wide. You can see from one side to another. This is a very dangerous place if something were to happen. Uh, sunken vessels, uh, vessels on fire or whatever. Right? And you're right between two, um, two very um, unstable uh, countries, right? You've got Yemen here on the north, which they're 
fighting among themselves, right? And then we've got Somalia down here with kind of reported as a failed government. So in this area, it's, it's, uh, it's the pirate area. So you have that. <clears throat> There's a, a major attack every every other day over there, and a lot of minor attacks on on vessels, smaller uh, tour vessels. And over here, this is our other. Whoop. This, of course, over to our left would be Iran and Iraq, tremendous oil producers. And you can see the number of of these are like this. I can, I can see this. This is a tanker. Okay, here's a picture of the tanker. I can see uh, where it's going to go. Um, and if this is, of course, is a free service. If I was to actually pay into this, I could see what their actual cargo is. But this is a major area and um, concerns by everyone, Europeans especially, because there are a lot of this oil on these tankers going out is going to Europe uh, of a major concern. And as you remember, some of those tankers had to go around um, uh, Africa, and that increases the, the cost uh, like $3 million per tanker, right? So, anyways, you can get this. It's just the, the, so you can see the thousands. I, I wanted to show you when you're doing international trade, the thousands and thousands of vessels that are out there, uh, most of this stuff is containerized, except for those that are carrying grain and uh, coal and bauxite and the other materials we might need. And, um, the number of vessels, just because they're so expensive, is rather, I would say, reduced but limited because they're investments. It's just like investing money in, in trucks. And if anything happens in the system, things begin to back up. Like over here in China, recent because of COVID virus, uh, some of the ports uh, start reduce their ability to discharge the vessels. And some of the vessels that should have been only in port for a week or so ended up being in port for 30 to 60 days. And that means that they can't go off somewhere else. And that's ad additional scarcity. So you may see if you're buying stuff in, uh, in a Home Depot or Lowe's or uh, any industrial equipment, you'll find out that your, your wait date on a refrigerator may be three weeks, six weeks, uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, and people who are installing refrigeration that are now waiting um, many, many weeks. Uh, they've been waiting two or three months to be able to get an entire uh, system set up. So, okay, this is what the different items that are in international international environment and we're doing uh, trade. And so we've got <clears throat> in international business, we've got to take into consideration marketing. Uh, marketing in different countries may be different, may be extremely controlled. Um, obviously, culturally, what how you market in a different country is, is um, important. When you bring a product into the United States, what that product may, how that product might market, may be dis very uh, distinct from how it was in its home market. Um, that's why you notice a lot of international products have. Um, names uh, that are catchy, not necessarily of the language. Think of uh, Haagen-Dazs. Haagen means nothing. It's not a real name. It was made up in the United States. Uh, Irish Spring for soap was a name made up for marketing, and there is no such soap in Ireland unless it's imported from the United States. Uh, cultural okay. issues. Um, Amazing. Yeah, culture, cultural issues. One of the assignments to uh, a friend of mine who, who who also teaches he he gave assignments for new in an entrepreneurial group and he said okay I want you to come in next week and present to me how you're going to um, import um, uh, American beer into Pakistan so one group got up and presented a certain way another group got up and said this is in into another group and they said well we have nothing to present he said, how can you not have anything to present he said well it's pr prohibited to import alcohol into Pakistan. Wow. Because they're Muslims. Can't That's import it. Right. Yeah. So but the other students never even investigated that. So when you're looking at, at going into a foreign market, you really have to be um, concerned as to what's allowed to be imported. And it may be even the how something is presented. It may have to be in 
one kilo bags, or it may have to be who knows. Uh, and a lot of stuff going into Canada that goes to to into the into the French speaking area has to have everything in uh, additionally in French. So uh, Michael, Michael, yes, can you ask you a couple of questions. Sure. We're getting, we're getting some, some questions. questions. What, what would you say, say are the, the first steps, steps to take, take when one when exports, exports something to another country? country? What, what would you say? say the, well, in, invest, in, investigate. Far, uh, just in a couple of slides down, I'm glad you asked that. A couple of slides down, we'll go through some steps about looking at. You want to look at the market. Um, here we're talking about how do you how do you finance? Um, how do you yeah, get paid? <laughs> how do you, exactly. How do you get paid? I mean, letters of credit. Okay. Are you getting guarantees? Um, are to per, you, you have to investigate the people you're dealing with. Like in any, even what you would. Here in the U.S., you have access to a lot more information about. I mean, I can find out who Alotero is, right? Uh, I can get background on you. I can get background on your company. I can go to the state and see that. I can see if there's lawsuits against you. This kind of thing. But in foreign countries, that always isn't available. And and then but, even uh, then, then you might be dealing with somebody's brother-in-law who is not tied to the company, but tied to the owner. You know what I mean? Is there a an, an government agency that could help people investigate other markets? Yeah, the, the department of, in, in our, our foreign assistance we have um the department of commerce has yes. all they're all over but more more heavily concentrated in europe than they are in latin america uh, but there's, there's usually a, a representative of the department of commerce in the embassies uh, i okay. may it used to be that they, they, they were foreign service officers today uh, many of those uh, are uh, foreign nationals but are our officer level uh, completely bilingual or multilingual and uh, if we wanted to go to Honduras, you and I all wanted to go, uh, we were interested in selling shoes into Honduras. We can go uh, to the Department of Commerce, see companies that, that want to do business with the United States most often will register with the uh, Department of Commerce. They'll, they may present balance sheets. They may present their background. They may present backgrounds on, their, on the owners. Um, they're not necessarily be, uh, Michael specifically the U.S. Commercial Service is that the division? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You so get different, can... different, and you can, you can. There's a, there's a thing called, I think, I believe it's called the Golden Key Service, okay. and it may cost you a few thousand dollars. But what you're going to do is, is, is uh, dealing with that particular country, uh, just like you have, you, you do trade missions, right? So it's right. something, something like that. You would go down, uh, but instead of having 15 people go with you like like you often do uh it would just be you and i we go down and we would have preset meetings with uh possible lawyers that could set, help us set up a company um uh, and, and give us the ins and outs of whether you know ownership and the laws and things and on a one-to-one -one basis uh, maybe four or five different uh either suppliers of materials where if we're buying to export or people who would buy our product and 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 um so you get a chance to see them uh, in, in a setting, either as an interview and, and could be in a hotel room or it could be at the, uh, at the consulate. And um, it, it's, a, it's a very, very good service. Some people like to, I, you know, I hate to say this, but some people want to do it on the cheap. You know, I know a guy kind of thing. And then they end up, I've seen many people uh, lose lots of money. Uh, by trying to do it them, themselves and not going through a, a process like you would any other this is this is serious stuff if you're gonna get oh, involved in money you do some really good due diligence take your time yep. uh, and, and, and look at your alternatives thing. you may you may end up in jail <laughs> yeah 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 what would you, when you, say, when you Michael, go um, that after COVID, how has the market change were before maybe it was one type of product that was being imported exported now i'm sure there's a whole different set of products it, after it, COVID, it, right? it seems that the um size of of business is is much smaller because people are more willing to do business through the internet and we have uh in our customs level now is like twenty five hundred dollars on declaration so the the Chinese manufacturers are sell directly business to consumer B to C as it's referred to business to consumer from China uh, just shipping stuff through either uh, you know like a FedEx or even the mail it may take you 30 days to get it here but uh, it'll arrive at your doorstep.
and and that's taking so. away business from you know and you can actually you can export the same way too does it look like uh, the times are improving because there was a big backlog because of covid right? Is it improving there's a there's a there's a, a pent up demand for many products um, and unfortunately in there was a uh, i think I, I don't know if i shared with you last week there was a um a show where we they're talking about um the steel shortage so there was a steel shortage in the us which caused a part shortage for for trucks mm -hmm. and that today we have more over the road trucks in the united states that are out of service because of lack of parts and you say, well, I'll just go out and buy a new truck. That's okay. You and I will go over to the truck place. But no, no, no. There's neither are there parts for the existing trucks. The chip, the chips are one of the things that there's a shortage of uh, for new trucks. So, so that means uh, that means the stuff doesn't move. Hmm? I'm sorry. No, I said so that some means that some, some stuff isn't moving. Manufacturers were backed up because they couldn't build the models because there were short parts. Tesla shut down for a while. I understand wow. because of lack of that. So. It's it's a when we do the supply chain, it's just that it's a chain, and any link in that that breaks means that something's going to happen. It reverberates through the system. There's a lack of uh, certain plastics, so there's no material for piping. So construction mm -hmm. is in certain areas is stopped because they're waiting on plastic. And other wow. people, one of the things that that was concerning, and this is something that that we all knew that the, the boomers were people who were on their way out, right? Right. So boomers are going to either retire or or die, one or the other. But they'll be out of the workforce, right? So what happened? What has happened more recently is they the, the logistics guys refer to it as the gray wave, in that for, because of the pandemic, a lot of people who would have who were working and were thinking of retiring several years from now ended up being home. And now you're saying, hey, let's go back to work, and they're going, no, well, you know what? I adjusted my economy. I'm living. I'm at home. Um, I'll just take early retirement. And I'll go off and get a part-time job. I, why am I going to go back? So we've lost people op that operationally that, that knew how to do things in in the chain, and either it's preparing raw materials or packaging or or logistics. And the system, the overall system in the U.S. has not was not ready for that. So we don't have the mechanization. And hiring new people, as you probably know, hiring people recently has been very 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 difficult. And hiring them into 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 physically demanding jobs is even more difficult. I think so, that Michael, based on your experience in, in international trade, but also in education, one of the things that always comes to uh, the, the topic of conversation when doing international trade, you mentioned this earlier, is the culture. Being yes. familiar with the culture, and even as important is to learn the language of the culture have somebody in your staff that speaks that language well because communication between countries today i mean i mm -hmm. talk to people from other countries and they think they're speaking english yeah <laughs> well that was that that was that 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 uh, video conference that we had at the very beginning there you see that what what are you saying i don't understand you're shaking yes. your head yes what did i agree to you know exactly. um it's it's a it's an issue now just because in 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 you you and I know this. We've worked together for a long time. Just knowing the language does that mean does that mean you're bicultural? You could be bilingual, but not bicultural. So you may not understand the culture, but you can speak the language. There's um many, many, several years ago, I wrote an article that was published. If you if you remember, it was called the Red Convertible. Yes. And I wish I had a I wish I had a die. I didn't. I would have put this up in a diagram. But there's a there's two universes that uses the marketing principle. There's a universe of, of red cars in the state of Florida. We have more red cars than other states. We have red cars. And then we have another universe that is convertibles. Right? So well, there's, a, there's an overlapping universe that are red convertibles. So in that area, we, we, we put that into international business. And we say, okay, we have, say, Anglos, Americans, or whatever you want, people in the U.S. And then we have, let's say, China or Africa, right? And we've got this other universe. And we need an overlapping area so that not only is there a language, but there's cultural understandings of how to do business. Sometimes people are, uh, if you're dealing with maybe Northern Europeans, they're often rather brusque compared to 
Latinos, right? So they're they're become some people become offended. Um, it's a clash. It's, it's a clash, and it's not be, yeah. you know even though the language that they may be, they may have managed to be able to speak uh, basic English to one another, but there's a there's a clash. I just worked with a gentleman out of Kentucky, wonderful gentleman, but he's a he's he's an operational guy at, out of coal mines, and his his he's he's got a like a maybe a second year of high school education. He just knows very well the guys in the mining. He knows the equipment. He can just tell you the specs on the different equipment and how to dig it out and, you know, the open pit mining and the wall mines and all kinds of stuff and the percentages of carbon. But when it comes to what well, we're doing, a letter of credit and they need a, a performance bond, you go, like, what's that? You know, and and so they send the guys in China would send them and said, well, we need this performance bond. He said, I can't do that. And the whole business starts falling apart because he doesn't, he said, they want me to guarantee all those shipment. He goes, no, this is the way this works. And somebody, I was the bread convertible for that deal. And yeah, you have to have it. somebody in the middle. They'll, the, deals, the deals fall apart. I've always seen these deals when they figure to get a translator and their translator will help us out. And yeah. no, no, it doesn't, a lot it doesn't of people work fail out. in international trade due to the lack of insight into the culture, into the other culture, mm -hmm. the language. And it's a whole different world for international trade. One of the things that I love about uh, Energy Mendes University is the uh, bilingual program where they actually teach people uh, how to speak Spanish, but they're doing it from a cultural perspective, not only from learning the language, right. like you do from a, a, a tape set. <laughs> people yeah. buy the tape set and they think they're going to be bilingual. And they miss out completely because they don't know how to pronunciate. So that one you're of the on, most you're important on, things you're on, you're on lingual, is learning yeah. a language from a, an institution that actually takes the view of exactly. culturally learning the right. language and the customs. So that I can mm -hmm. congratulate Andy Mendes for doing that. And you being a professor there, obviously you understand how important since, that is since, for since 2007, I guess here here in here in uh, in Miami since two. In, in 2007, uh, 2006, I believe they had their first class. But they're in in um, Tampa, Orlando. They were in Orlando for quite a while. They're in uh, in Texas and Colorado, right? And they're in Virginia, here yeah, in the well, U.S. They're adding, and they have, yeah, Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. Also, they're doing uh, looking to open new campuses in other countries. The other thing about Energy Med is that it's also online so they have students from all over the world that take classes online so it is really a, a great right. opportunity for people to learn uh, i've been doing and, i've been doing classes online recently huh? you mentioned the, something um uh, how do people get paid can you give us a, an idea of what yeah let's people see look at when people have to i wish i had that's it uh we didn't do that, wish I had that one okay yeah what basically what do you have to get um uh, okay, here's here's that's piggy. It's a piggyback export. Let me see. I think I, let's see. I've got a couple of entering the market. Okay, this and you asked about entering the market. So let, yeah, let me go back and then we'll go to. So this is this one. To determine the approach. The approach to one how you enter your market. You have to look at market size. And sometimes the size of a market in another country is 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 so small, and somebody's mm -hmm. already there, and and they're not going to roll over and play dead just because you want to get in. So. Um, if, if the market is is uh, large enough and growing, then it's easier to get in. If the market is is uh, relatively small and not growing, people are going to make problems for you. Um, case in point, one of my students was associated with the company sending used tires to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And not that there was anything wrong with these tires, even though the people buy used tires here in the United States all the time and in other countries out of the U.S., but the local tire uh, representative that was sold new tires imported went to the uh, like the police and and said to them well these are used tires they're probably unsafe so the jamaican government prohibited the import of used tires no way yeah so they were out they were, out, they were in business and out of business all in a couple of months yeah they made they made it they made it into a monopoly uh and this can happen this can uh, happen to you. It should be the specifications. Um, there was an um, one of the that I, that I show with our students is we have um, the uh, video players. I believe back years ago when we had the the tapes, 
that they were being imported into France and France apparently had interest in their colony. Somebody else was producing them that they had interest. So they didn't prohibit the import, but they required the, the uh, video players to be inspected. And you had to go from the port to a, a small town in, inland from, from, the, from the port. And they would sit there for several months until the inspectors got a chance to look at them and approve them for import. So they killed them. So you really, you really have to be, be, be careful. So is it a growth market? Um, what's your, what's your share going to be <clears throat> in um, the product and then product be handled? What type of product you're, you're going to handle? So marketing strategies, uh, the export, and that's why we were just looking at piggybacking, which is a way to export. Suppose um, you're, you're making cartons and uh, you're really not going to get involved in the, in the export of the carton or the packaging material, but a exporter, is is going to do that so you export um you've been, you've been supplying him here and uh, he established he or she but as the company establishes something in in this case was ireland they establish a small manufacturing operation in ireland and they need the packaging material so now you you're going to export to the, to the company in ireland that's affiliated with them and now you've got a piggyback you piggyback what, um, mm -hmm. what is a little of credit michael Okay, we'll go back to LC. Let me know. I got something down here. Okay, um, a letter of credit is a. It's a very, very, very old. They've existed uh, since like three, four hundred years uh, before Christ. They existed. Uh, there, it's a document that says if you ship, you're going to get paid. So okay, we'll go that's to. That's the key. That's it. It's the, 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 the by the banks, right? The, yeah, the export, the, the export, the documents, the the the, the shipping documents. Uh, go uh, the docs will get you your money. So that the, basically it says, uh, Al, if you ship me, uh, you know, five hundred pairs of shoes of this size and of this quality, uh, packaged in a certain way, <clears throat> I will pay you. So I go to my bank. <clears throat> and I have either the money deposited or I have the credit with the, with the, with the bank and we issue a letter goes to you and you look at the letter of credit and you're with your banker and say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll accept this and we'll ship. So you ship, you present the bill of lading, you present the um, maybe a SGS inspection, uh, you press a, maybe a quality report, a third party quality report, something like that. And uh, the invoice and you present that to the bank, the banker sits down and goes through, Banker doesn't know anything about shoes. He just looks at, oh, sure. invoice, uh, quality report, check, uh, bill of lading, check, 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 okay. And he sends those documents for collection back over to my bank. My banker looks at, calls up and says, hey, Mike, your, your documents are in for your shoes. I go over and look and I go, yep, okay, approved, make the payment. And they make the payment. Now I'm going to get my, I get original documents that I can go to, I present in customs and get my cargo out. That's good. And, uh, I need those original. And that's basic. That's 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 kind of that's count, kind credit. of how it works. Okay. Right. So, that's so, so the documents, the documents equal. You go to the letter of credit. The letter of credit is almost like a mini contract. It, it spells out what documents, and, and in what time period. Because sometimes that's they'll right. say in the next sixty days, this stuff has to be shipped. I'm not going to sit here and wait a year, right? right. It says, right. yeah, uh, Al's got to ship the shoes in the next thirty days. So your documents have to be cut and everything within those within those 30 days and there's an insurance that you, you, insu may, you insurance, i may yeah. i may require you to in, to insure the product wow. so you pay you pay for the insurance but i'm i'm the beneficiary of that insurance because because i'm paying and you can go through income terms which i'm mentioning here it's the international chamber of commerce icc 2021 um this is a wonderful you get the icc um, a website and you have the income terms. You have, you you can find uh, um, drafts of uh, commission contracts. You can find drafts of of shipping contracts. You can find almost any kind of um, contract that you would have in international trade. You could find there, and you can find them in multiple languages. I mean, you can look at Thai, and you can look at a German, Spanish, English, uh, Chinese. I mean, it's everything's there. So the other thing, uh, if I were to Summarize the main things. The first is the market research. That's crucial. Uh -huh. Let's go back over here. Whoop, whoop, whoop. What happened? We're going up. Oh, this. Uh, okay, market research. One of the things I just before we go too far. This is um. There's a a thing that I want you to look at. I'm, I'm running out of time, right? Yeah, we have about uh 
10 minutes. So I just yeah. want to summarize some of the key points. I, I do. I, I just want you to be careful of who you're dealing with. And this yes. is United States Department of Treasury. And you can you can snapshot this. It's screenshot this, guys. You're going to look at it. This is the the uh, the office that controls asset control. Office of financial and what asset. we'll do, Michael, is we're going to make that presentation available so people can yes. reach us later and we'll send them the presentation. Right. So here, if I if I went on here, if I, I go on, if I was to click on here. But we're not, would, uh, we're not seeing your presentation anymore. So No. You're not. That's what happened here. No, I, I am. am. Oh, okay. So this this one here it says US Department of Treasury. Yes. yes. Yeah, this controls sanctions. So it lists people, companies, and countries. So if you were going to send to somebody in Sudan or even in Paris, uh, I can run or you can run their name in here, run a couple of different spellings, and you can say, well, I want an 80% match or a 90% or 100% match. And it will come up with if that person is is listed as don't do business with on some kind of watch oh, list okay. or right. their company. Uh, or their company is on a watch list, or that the the product the products can't be shipped to that country. Like Sudan is, and this this is to be careful of when you're working with people. You're offshore, and there's a case of like somebody from a U.S. company uh, negotiated the transport of cargo from South Sudan to Belgium, and it was prohibited to. The, the particular people in South Sudan were prohibited to do business with, Got and they it. were fined one hundred and fifty thousand dollars because they were, even though they were in the United States and the business was offshore, they had facilitated that business and it was illegal. So you have to really be careful of who you're dealing with, and you can check check this out. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I saw some. Of yes. The things that we get also also people, people that are in other countries, countries looking, looking to, to export to the U.S. US. Is, is there, there a place, place here, here that they can contact, contact to find out, out how to? Other through the U.S. Embassy, they might. I don't think they get as much a response as if they dealt with their embassy here in the U.S. Oh yeah. Most of, most of the embassies, the smaller countries, maybe not, but in the, the larger countries uh, in Latin America, in 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 Europe, have offices here. Yes. In their in their consulates and in often in their embassies, they have a person or persons the that trade officers would exactly, or maybe a trade officer, or um, I was thinking of me, maybe it was you and I actually made a contact with something in Germany, and we got the Germans, the German exactly. trade people, to yeah, to to verify uh, certain things about the, oh, the people we're dealing perfect. with. I remember perfect. that, yeah. So it, 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 you you got to go back to like you were saying, you got to do, do your due diligence, you got to do homework. Um, not not to rush into a lot of these things. I know that the money may be out there, and you think you're going to make a lot, but you may not get paid, or you may get faulty product, or wh what else? You know, just it's uh, terrible. So I want you to see that. You had another. These are some some of the general things that that happen. We send the letter of intent. That means very general. L -L -I. That, yeah, an LOI, right? And uh, it, it's kind of it kind of goes in progression. You may jump ahead, but. Uh, an LOI, maybe you've interchanged a couple of emails or something saying this is kind of what we want to do. This is the That's volume, right. how we're going to do it. And then you have a maybe something larger. You're going to have a memorandum of understanding, which often is almost like a contract. It does a lot of specs. It's a little financial information, not maybe not a lot. Uh, then we get into this sort, sort, soft corporate, corporate offer, which I kind of spell out what I would offer you as far as shipping and, and uh, of credit, what I expect you to have a top bank. Um, one of the yeah. things to be careful of when you were talking about the banking, uh, just from experiences, we want, if you're doing somebody to uh, send something to Chad, right? Well, you got the downtown five cent savings bank of Chad, which is going to offer offer a guarantee that they're a local guy, but guess what? There's no way of collecting on that. You'd have to go over to Chad, right? So you want to know, okay, this is your bank, sir, but I want to know what's the corresponding bank. And they say, well, it's HSBC London. Oh, HSBC London. That's good. Now, why that's good is because I want to get paid when I ship. So I, my letter of credit says when I present my documents to my bank, the shipper's bank at my counter, the bank's my bank is going to pay me because they have a corresponding relationship with that bank in Chad. Somebody, Somebody asked them, Michael, mm -hmm. how to save money with exporting. 
how to save money in exporting? That's that's a very, very broad question. <laughs> well, first of all, I think that you have to have a reputable uh, logistic, shipping logistics company. Right. And yeah, there's, 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 that, there's uh, many, there's many, in, it, your, uh, mm, there's many, many companies in, in Miami. Money. Yeah, there's many, many uh, um, companies in, in Miami wh who, although may have goodwill, do not have appropriate experience. So when you're dealing, when you're shopping for a third, well, a 3PL, a third party logistics uh, company to cut your documents, to package your stuff, uh, to handle it, it's, it's worth knowing that uh, they're large enough and they're connected like dhl has yeah. affiliate agents mm -hmm. and um you may be paying a little more but you know what it's going to get there dhl isn't going to disappear overnight they're going to they're going to respond uh, to whatever's done and they have agents and people like you say know the culture know what's happening and they can tell you from the very beginning the problems you might have with your product getting in there. I just wanted to, this full corporate offer was the next thing that we, you were going to yeah, make up. We have three minutes, Michael. Okay. This, whoop, let's go back to the IC, whoop, what this one here. This one I wanted to make make known. This is an ICPO. It's an irrevocable corporate purchase order. And if you're doing this internationally, this is a legal document. And sure. if you and I do a sign on this and we don't have the money or the product, it's fraud. Got it. And and somebody wants to get Interpol after you, they do something locally and then that turn into a into the Interpol. When you're going through customs someplace or immigration, you may be detained. Well, some of the key players, Michael, are definitely are contacting somebody in the US government, US commercial service. Right. The other one is if you can find an international attorney that does business with that country, they'll guide you to the legal process. Right. Finding a a big shipping logistics company that provides all the services to mm -hmm. the paperwork. Because if you don't have the paperwork cor were correct, and I've seen this, your shipment could sit in a warehouse in the other country for years. It may never, never be, right. never be, never be uh, allowed to import, and they may either destroy it or, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of opportunities, I think, Michael, to kind of. Uh, bring this to a close. We could go on for hours. There's so many things involved in import export, but the main thing that we know is there's a massive opportunity for your business to grow looking at exporting because over 90% of the world's consumers reside outside of the US. Exactly. So, and, but if you don't do it right, then you are going to lose money and time and you're going to be very, very unhappy. So having the right contacts here, having the right contacts there, uh, it's going to make a difference having reputable companies that are going to get the product there. And yet it's easy to check them out because yeah. they're you start checking them out. nationals. Yeah. You and might you have, mm -hmm. um, I think, I think your advice on using, using like, you know, we were saying using these, these large reputable ones, uh, they, they definitely have the volume. They can compete. You, you, if you start, once you start doing business with them, you, I'm sure you can renegotiate some of the, some of the, the costs uh that that they are they're charging you because if, be, if it becomes repetitive business uh you might be able to renegotiate with them and the other is if you you're going you, you travel the other country or the person on the other the other end or you to your to your importer uh that to the person who's sending you the product being on this side you come up with better ways uh, cheaper ways uh but okay, you, so you want to you want to get started with reputable people mm -hmm. so what we want to do is we want to uh, post this would be on uh all of our channels for people to review later. We're going okay. to make your presentation available. We're going to put your contact information on all of our social media. Okay. The other thing is they can send an email to trade center at global trade chamber dot com exactly. with all of your questions because we have a lot of questions which just could not get to. So send an email to trade center at global trade chamber dot com. We'll forward it to Michael, and we have a lot of experts that are going to help you. Uh, your opportunities are endless. But you have to do the right things and meet the right people to help it work. Michael, your wealth yeah. of information. And uh, you. without you helping us, we would be lost because all <laughs> these people that want to export, they don't know where to start. So you gave us some very important topics and they'll have access to you in the future. So thank you for your time, Michael. Thank, thank you God. for your knowledge, your Appreciate experience. It. And thank you, Energy Mendes, for presenting and, and supporting us with all this information for the community. Uh, yeah. We bid you a goodbye wherever you are in the world, 
and we look forward to the next one. We probably should do a continuation. Thank you, Michael. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.